I'm ready. You just tell me when. We're rolling. We're rolling. Okay. Yeah. In our previous session... Oops, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that, that nobody doesn't hear me. So okay. Just take a pause and we'll start. In our previous session, we discussed the historical context within which developmental thinking emerged. In this session, we will discuss the three modernization strategies, namely economic, political, and social, that were central to how development was conceived at that time. What were these modernization goals and how were they translated into public policies? More importantly, what kind of technological know-how was necessary to achieve these goals? In the 1950s, economic modernization meant large-scale rapid industrialization and industrialization required urbanization because manufacturing capacity was to be created in the cities. In the rural areas, the goal was to increase agricultural production through mechanization, which required land consolidations from numerous small plots to large land holdings. The improvement of productivity in both sectors, agriculture and industry, needed to be carried out simultaneously. Please note that in both sectors, the increase in productivity required large-scale production facilities to reap the benefits of what economists call economies of scale. The important technological implication of the model is that only with the use of modern technology, large-scale production facilities could be started at a lower cost per unit. Profits were to be maximized not only by keeping the cost down, but also selling the manufactured items to an increasing number of consumers. I'm mentioning this to explain why big scale, the logic of big markets and big production, was seen as necessary for generating economic growth. We'll return to this issue in a later session when we'll discuss how surprisingly bigness came to be questioned as a developmental strategy. In thinking historically, one needs to understand that there was a relationship between the large-scale production and the organizational structure necessary for managing it. Large-scale production required a high level of planning, which in turn required centralized decision-making by large organizations. Lacking large domestic private manufacturing firms, the burden to initiate growth fell on the public sector in many newly established nations. This kind of a production strategy required a particular kind of spatial organization of human settlements. Instead of the dispersed rural hamlets that were typical in colonial times, now the focus shifted to cities which were to reap the benefits of agglomeration. Urban centers had to expand because workers needed to live close to their work. And business required exchange of ideas where spatial proximity of different inputs for business was beneficial. Rural urban migration became necessary to increase supply in the urban labor force, driving wages down, thereby creating a competitive advantage for these nations in the global marketplace. Economic development was assumed to happen in stages. First, countries would start producing simpler technologies, gradually substituting locally produced goods for imports. After this learning phase was complete, they would start investing in more advanced manufacturing and engage fully with the global market. However, there was an argument made about leapfrogging and big push to catch up with the industrial West. I want to emphasize the reason for the preference for large scale. Dubbed the big push model, the large scale approach to industrialization was justified as a way for developing nations to catch up quickly. 
In practice, it meant big infrastructure projects for creating the industrial base, large investment by governments, and large-scale technological transformation. This large-scale transformation required technological innovations as well as adaptations. These processes were expected to be led by an entrepreneurial elite. The poor, in contrast, considered neither innovative nor entrepreneurial. They were to serve as the new working class in large factories. The cultivation of entrepreneurial elites became an important national development goal. It was assumed that the entrepreneurial class would lead in the growth process due to multiple reasons, their capability to save, to invest, to innovate, to introduce new technologies and so on. I am emphasizing this point because in later sessions, we will show how the qualities that were ascribed then to the entrepreneurs and the poor, respectively, sharply contrast with the qualities we ascribe to them today. Let me say a few words regarding political modernization. The creation of a new economic structure with superior technology was a necessary but insufficient condition for sustainable growth. As we mentioned in the last lecture, the conventional wisdom then was that sustained economic growth required Western-style democracy. Without the formation of a national state that exercised complete control over a territory and its citizens, it was impossible to create a unified market, which was also a necessary condition for rapid economic growth. Therefore, the two interconnected aims, the establishment of a modern nation state and that of a liberal democracy, became the main foci of the process of political modernization. Technologically speaking, both democracy and the nation state needed sound communication and transportation infrastructure. Democracy required well-informed citizens in which radio technology then played an important role. Governance by the nation state also required effective communication within different government agencies as well as between the state missionary and citizens. At the same time, without good roads and communication systems in place, governments could hardly ensure different groups of people spread across different agencies and regions would complement each other's work. Centralized political leadership was critical to facilitate both private and public investments. In other words, new technologies were viewed as a key factor in the formation of this new national political community. Important to note, both technological know-how and the provision of infrastructure were to be under the strict control of the national government. Recall what I said earlier about the assumption made then about people living in poverty? Modern reformers considered poverty as a major sign of backwardness. The mindset of the poor was to be radically altered through the process of social modernization. The process of social modernization was supposed to create a new man from the colonial subject to the modern citizen, with a new rationality underpinned by scientific thinking. This new man was expected to be familiar with the use of new machineries so as to participate in the modern industrial workforce. In the villages too, he or she was to use modern agricultural products, the expansion of access to formal education and technical training were key to shaping this new individual. Social modernization also redefined the relationship between the individual and his or her work. Technological change in the workplace was a factor in this redefinition. The mechanized, repetitive nature of factory work shaped how people manage their time and, as a result, their daily routines and lifestyles. Life in subsistence agriculture was dependent on the vagaries of the weather, its seasonal fluctuations, and the constraints posed by the specificities of the local condition. In contrast, in the new industrial workplace, 
these constraints were not to matter thanks to technological progress. There needed to be a sharp division between work and home in order to increase productivity. Whereas in traditional economic activities, the line between one's daily life and work were blurred, modern work was to have its own ethos and routine influence the rhythms of industrial workplace. Since our lectures are focused on evaluation, let us discuss the dominant methodology of technology evaluation then of development projects and policies. Coming out of the Second World War, there was a huge emphasis in developmental thinking on learning from wartime planning. Defining development goals as a war on poverty justified borrowing from wartime practices of evaluation projects and policies. The foremost among these practices was cost-benefit analysis, which was based on specific targets regarding which there was unanimous agreement among the planners. Since the cost and benefits of the wartime strategies could be quantified, it was assumed the same could be done for development projects as well. This mechanical approach to evaluation, which borrows from the logic of wartime planning, of course, has its limitations when applied to developmental projects. For one, the goal of development are not as clear as the goals of war. Second, the cost and benefits of wartime calculations are not really applicable to the complex task of understanding the cost and benefits of the triple modernization that required massive changes in various aspects. Unlike wartime cost-benefit evaluation, which usually would be carried out by the centralized command of the army, development projects came to be assessed by a variety of stakeholders, including the poor themselves. This complexity had to be captured in a new evaluation methodology. We'll discuss this later lectures as we analyze why this three-pronged modernization strategy came to be questioned even by its early supporters.